He would never have called himself an intellectual. Um, he didn't really like the word. He was much more interested in um, the kind of background organizing work. And that I think is why he has um, not got the attention that other uh, anti-colonial organizers, pan-Africanists have received. Um, so that's, that's the starting point. I mean, his, to know more about him is to know those facts, is to know that his, um, his intellectual work was done in order to organize, to give people the tools to fight the colonial system. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. Uh, so Leslie, thank you so much for joining me on The No Show. I'm really pleased to have you. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, excellent. So you have a sort of uh, uh, quite a wide area of interest um, in that you look at, you know, um, imperialism, anti-imperialism, pan-Africanism, um, what sort of drove you to, to explore so many sort of areas? I mean, I guess there's a, a common thread between them, but what, but what, what sort of led you to, to explore all of this? Um, there be, yeah, there became a common thread. Um, I think it's really interesting to trace the thread of your own intellectual autobiography and trajectory. And actually with my master's students, I ask them to do this um, as well, because I think it's really interesting. In my case, um, I would say my intellectual trajectory started with um, reading Dostoevsky and Tolstoy in high school and becoming fascinated by Russian literature. So then I started studying Russian history. And then I started moving into revolutionary histories um, and looking in specifically at Russia and Latin America. But then the Caribbean kept coming back. Um, it was kind of at the skirt of what, uh, outskirts of what I was studying. And then my partner gave me a book that he was reading in undergrad, um, which was CLR James's Black Jacobins. And uh, I had never, I think it's quite telling that I had never read it in, as he was taking English, I was taking history. And in history, I never read that book. In fact, I knew nothing about the Haitian Revolution, even though I had taken a class in modern revolutions. Mm -hmm. um, and so that just kind of lit my fire. And then I started reading um, a friend of CLR James called George Padmore, when I started to get interested in, in reading more African history. And then I completed my PhD on George Padmore, um, which kind of took me all over the world because as we can discuss, George Padmore was born in Trinidad, moved to the United States, um, became a communist, worked for Russia, moved to Russia and worked for the Soviet Union, lived in Germany, and then ended his life in London. Most of it spent most of the rest of his life in London working on leading anti-colonial struggles around the Caribbean, Africa, um, India, he had networks all over the place. And so I ended up kind of studying somebody who brought me into all of the spaces that you identified at the beginning. Um, but I think that if I think about following my own intellectual trajectory, it exemplifies the usefulness of what are now called global histories as methods that allow historians to see where and when interconnection is happening, mm -hmm. um, but also, um, also the contingency of it, the, the need to look at when and where 
um, interconnection and circulation of ideas is happening. Um, and in what scholars would now call the Black Atlantic. So my frame is the Black, at, what people would call the Black Atlantic. So George um, Padmore is, seems like uh, an incredibly um, sort of diverse character in many ways in that, you know, he's from the Caribbean. He went to the US, which is the, basically the, the belly of capitalism to become a communist. Mm -hmm. there. Um, and sort of, it's a very incredible journey. So give us more, more about this character, because I, I think this character doesn't sort of get enough recognition. Yeah, um, he, he definitely doesn't. He's kind of on the outskirts. And I, one of the things I like to try to, I tried to do in my book is explore why. Mm. And I think one of the reasons why is because um, his, his political work, his intellectual work, he would never have called himself an intellectual. Um, he didn't really like the word. He was much more interested in um, the kind of background organizing work. And that I think is why he has um, not got the attention that other uh, anti-colonial organizers, Pan-Africanists have received. Um, so that's, that's the starting point. I mean, his, to know more about him is to know those facts, is to know that his, um, his intellectual work was done in order to organize, to give people the tools to fight the colonial system. So um, what happened to him in his biography is that you know he moves from Trinidad to the United States where he experiences American racism in the in the US South um, and uh, and then into New York City so he's in the South and then he's in um, New York City in Harlem in the midst of all of the kind of Harlem Renaissance discussions and then he's recruited to the Soviet Union because he's um, like many Caribbean um, political activist. He's very well spoken. He's very articulate. Commands people's presence, and so he gets recruited to work for the Soviet, um, the Soviet Communist International. But through that work, and through that work, he he essentially meets um, a, a cadre of people that are going to be part of his network for the next thirty years. Um, and he publishes a newspaper called The Negro Worker. Uh, he changes his name. He's not born George Padmore. He's born Malcolm Nurse. Okay. Um, changes his name to George Padmore. And because of his work with the Communist International, he's known as George Padmore pretty much around the world by the early 1930s. Um, and so he keeps that name even after he leaves the Communist Party. Um, he leaves the Communist Party in the mid-1930s because he uh, sees that Stalin is only fleetingly concerned with um, anti-colonial struggle. Mm. And so he, he says, I'm not going to work with these organizations that don't prioritize uh, the situation of colonized peoples. Spends the next almost 20 years in London. And just you know, from his little flat with his partner, Dorothy Pizer, who again, doesn't get enough attention um, spends the next 20 years essentially setting up a system of uh, correspondence, both in terms of letters, but in terms of journalism. And it's his journalism that laid, led me into my, a lot of my later work, because what I essentially found was that he was the main node of a network that stretched throughout the African continent um, the Caribbean, the United States, because he wrote prolifically for new, Black American newspapers, very famous Black American newspapers like the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier. During the war, he was a correspondent for them. Um, but he also clipped and reprinted and wrote um, and circulated news such that basically now that I'm looking more in more detail at newspapers in 
Ghana, Nigeria, Trinidad, Jamaica, you see that he was kind of the person who would clip, reprint, send other people information, and then get this dispersal network of um, information into newspapers in, um, in different parts of the African continent. And even actually, since I've published my book, you know, I still find new stuff. He, I find stuff in South African newspapers. I find connections to, um, you know, people who are working in Malaysia. He had friendships all around the world. Um, and his role, I think he saw his role as connect, informing and connecting people. It's a very interesting position to play in a struggle like, like, like the, the, the one that he experienced um, because of how tough a task it is. I mean, I can't imagine it to be simple to, you know, be trying to reproduce this information and get it spread across Africa and the Caribbean. So does that sort of, who, who gave him the backing to do this work? Uh, no, no one, <laughs> which is, which makes it even more, um, incredible. He, um, I mean, he had the backing of the communist international, but then of course, when he left them, he also had their ire and, um, you know, there was real active work to, um, work against him, both in terms of the communist international and certainly the British colonial office. Um, so let me, I'll say more about how, you know, he was a source of concern, um, that was trying to be silenced, but let me say more about how he did what he did. I mean, I said his door, his Padmore Dorothy Pizer was kind of essential. Um, she was both mainly the paid, uh, paid person in that household that got them there uh necessities he's also working during um wartime and post-war um in post-war conditions he did get paid um for his newspaper articles in uh the pittsburgh courier and um the chicago defender and things like that but otherwise um he just he was just doing it on his own um he worked very closely with a lot of British socialists and there's more research, um, uh, some, some people are doing more research now on his collaboration and his influence on British socialists. I mean, he, he did actually have a major influence on the way that British socialists began to see imperialism as essential to what they were doing. And that was part of his work was to say, look, you cannot liberate the working class in Britain unless you understand the connection to um, colonized workers. Um, so how he did it was, was without a lot of other backing and against um, odds. So because he was known to be a communist and he remained a Marxist, even though he left the communist party, but he was on all the lists of, of the secret service, you know, his mail was being read um, he was being observed, um, like many of the uh, people like Kwame Nkrumah and Jomo Kenyatta and Namdi Azikwe, the leaders of African um, independence movements were also, their mail was being opened. Um, and uh, what I found also is that because he was a, known to be a Marxist, he became the center of uh, colonial office concerns about communism in the colonies in the Cold War. And so when you open up British colonial office files about uh, preventing Soviet propaganda in the colonies, the name on in all of the colonial office discussion is George Padmore because they think quite rightly that he, well, they misunderstand his Marxism and his Pan-Africanism, but they rightly understand that he is very well connected and that his ideas are influencing uh, a lot of people in the colonies. Who was his um, major influence, would you say? Who was his major influence? Uh, he was inspired, his father uh, was part of the early Pan-Africanist uh, 
um, movement led by Henry Sylvester Williams, who was also a Trinidadian. Um, so he was he was inspired by Henry Sylvester Williams, um, in particular in in his in his Pan Africanism. Um, he has a complicated history to Marxism, Leninism, and Stalin, of course. Um, he's inspired by Lenin's anti-imperialism, certainly. Uh, and Stalin's claim to support colonial struggles. Um, and he's actually one of the lesser known aspects of his thinking and his history is that um, he, he's inspired by the USSR as what he say, sees as a decolonized society. So he's not just inspired by their, uh, by the communist movement, but by, um, and, and the USSR did a lot to cultivate this idea that they were um, at the vanguard of decolonizing the former Russian empire. And so that also inspired him a lot. And he remains, even as he moves to Ghana at the end of his life and it, um, advises Kwame Nkrumah, part of that advising involved looking at how he believed the Soviet Union had taken the Russian empire and given um, greater equality and liberation to the peoples on the outskirts of the Russian empire. There's a, a, a sort of a, a question that comes to mind because um, you mentioned that the the colonial office um, misunderstood his Pan-Africanism. So what was his Pan-Africanism? Um, his, there's a few different, I mean, Pan-Africanism uh, can be either a cap capitalized or non-capitalized. Mm in the sense that there is um, an understanding of Pan-Africanism as, as a specific organizational um, movement that hopes for um, the unity of the African continent, for example, or of organizations. So his Pan-Africanism is certainly one of um, organized associations. He's at the forefront of organizing the 1945 Manchester Pan-African Congress. So what he his Pan-Africanism emphasizes is organizing people together to, um, to advocate for um, a shared future together. Um, but I think he also did understand Pan-Africanism as a cultural and social connection and certainly an economic connection. So his Pan-Africanism emphasizes for example, the role of capitalism in, um, in the practice of enslavement, in the histories of enslavement of Atlantic, uh, of the Atlantic slave trade, which produces the capitalist economy, um, as he and um, his colleague Eric Williams and CLR James, all, they both argued these things as well. And so his Pan-Africanism emphasizes the socioeconomic um, connection of African and African descended peoples through um, through the interconnection of imperialism, enslavement, and capitalism as it came to be in the Americas. How sort of um, do, does that sort of follow the line of, of Marcus Garvey? It does follow the line, although they were famously uh, antagonistic. He was quite brutal um, in his condemnation of Garvey at times. Oh, right. Wow. Uh, because, well, because he saw Garvey as, um, as, as a kind of capitalist, uh, as, as somebody who was arguing for, um, as, and, and as someone that was fooling um, African peoples in African descended peoples into um, believing that they could separate themselves off um, and that they could, by beginning businesses um, like the Black Star Line, um, <coughs> excuse me, that that would solve the problems. And so he didn't agree with Garvey um, in terms of the kind of ideological strain. However, 
later in his life, he recognized the movement that Garvey created. In his last book, Pan-Africanism or Communism, he, he, he centers Garvey as essential to Pan-African histories. So even as in the 1930s, he was um, vocally kind of critical, he would show up, um, if Garvey came to speak in London in Hyde Park, he would show up and heckle him and, um, and others. But at the end, he always recognized the mm, crucial importance that Garvey played in building uh, a worldwide movement. So yeah. That's very interesting because, um, I mean, to what extent was the difference um, ideological and was there an element of like ego involved there? Um, possibly an element of ego, although I, I would think not, because if you look at Padmore's history and his activity, there is uh, no, very little ego in his, um, in his politics. He, he always is the man behind the scenes. In my book, I describe him as kind of the man behind the scenes. Um, He's, he's rarely the person at the front of the stage. He's rarely the person who, um, he puts other people at the front of movements and then he kind of organizes and connects them. So because of that, I, I don't think that ego is really at play in him. Um, I, I actually think it really was a fundamental ideological disagreement in the 1930s. Um, and I will add to that, and this is part of what I'm currently working on. I'm currently working on um, uh, ideas about what Padmore called colonial fascism. Um, and uh, what I'm doing right now is looking at how actually in West Africa and the Caribbean, you see a very wide debate in the 1930s about uh, what is the nature of fascism and how is it similar or different from colonialism? Um, and so I can say, say more about that, but one thing is that in the 1930s, um, Garvey famously said that he thought that the, his organization, the UNIA, were the first fascists. And that, you know, while he criticized um, German anti-Semitism and later backtracked, there's a strain of, Garvey's, of Garvey's thought which did um, praise Mussolini's kind of proud and strong nationalism. Um, and so there's a really complicated history with Garvey um, and with a number of, of black nationalists who are drawn to fascism um, because they believe that it, uh, it, it fights for its people. It has a kind of strong, um, a strong masculinist narrative that also fits with uh, a lot of, of the UNIA and Garveyism. So I say that because that's another aspect of Garvey and Padmore's disagreement is that Padmore was fundamentally anti-fascist, fundamentally anti-colonial anti, an anti anti-fascist, and he absolutely disagreed with Garvey on Garvey's understanding of fascism. I want to talk about um... I want to get into this a bit more and your current work and, and I want to sort of talk about your earlier experiences and of, of colonialism and and, and uh, imperialism. Um, but before I do, I just want to remind our audiences that they can um, support the show by, um, you know, helping us out on Patreon. You can just access our Patreon um, page on patreon.com forward slash the no show. Um, any support um, becoming a member really just helps us get more academics like Leslie and showing the amazing work they're doing. So um, please do show some support. Um, so you mentioned that, you know, early on in your, in your earlier on in your, in your career, or I guess in your academic life, you'd never heard of the Haitian revolution. And of course that's telling in many ways of the fact that, academia is fundamentally still colonized mm -hmm. where yeah. did you sort of um what was your reaction to it um 
my reaction is is the same now as many students when I teach my modern Caribbean and we read Eric Williams and CLR James Black Jacobins and and um, and Padmore and uh, Walter Rodney and uh, Maurice Bishop is uh, a little bit of anger and frustration that why didn't I know about this before? How could I take whole modules and not ever be told um, that there was a major revolution which actually fundamentally challenged um, in, in a basic way what no other revolution of the time was challenging, which was you know, people's basic humanity and, and freedom and, and setting out really honestly much more universal anti-racist, um, anti-colonial rights for people. Um, and so I also should say, I mean, this doesn't come into my research, but I grew up in Canada, in Southern Ontario, and it took me to, it, it took me studying Padmore and um, studying a lot of the kind of Caribbean and African thinkers that have helped me to think and understand over the last decade or so of my academic career. But it took that for me to realize that I came from a colonized society and history as well. And that um, in the Canadian narrative, the fact that Canada is a settler colony um, and that I grew up next to reservations um, that were completely separated spaces from where I grew up, I was not aware of that um, in my education until until much later on. Um, so I think that that was for me, that was also a, a part of of my intellectual um, development that I had to come to terms with. And so the work that you, you're the, the research that you're sort of um, doing now, uh, where does that sort of how does that build on, on the work that you've done in the book? So um, in a few ways, I mean, the first thing is that going to doing the work on Padmore um, helped me realize a few limitations of, of, of my own work in that respect and of uh, scholarship more general. The first is that what I wanted to start to do with my current work is to um, reframe some of the circuits of what we would call the Black Atlantic um, by again joining a, a lot of other, other scholarship, which emphasizes that this is uh, this is certainly histories of enslavement, but that there is so much more richness to it than that. That we don't need to just tell the stories of enslavement, um, but we can actually talk about um, a lot of other a lot of other aspects of people's lives. Um, and secondly, uh, and most importantly, that I didn't start my work or career thinking that I would be, I would call myself an intellectual and political historian. Um, but doing Padmore's, recognizing Padmore as an intellectual, even though he didn't want to be, didn't think of himself as an intellectual, um, made me realize that what I wanted to do with my work now was to acknowledge um, intellectual histories and expand intellectual histories. And, and I see this as part of, of, um, of ways of shifting the, um, the, the scholarly work to open up and bring in more voices. And I am trying to do that now by bringing in more voices, both in terms of the kind of intellectual productivity of colonized peoples um, who are, having serious intellectual debates in spaces other than books and pamphlets and novels. So part of what I'm trying to do is argue that we can find intellectual histories and they've been written out primarily because we think intellectual and political history is just about books and pamphlets. Um, but that actually we can look, for example, to everyday newspapers, which is what I'm doing and see these as sites of intellectual debate um, and also, uh, I wanted to move away from the kind of great men narrative, which Padmore still fits into. So Padmore has been 
obscured, but he's still part of that kind of great man intellectual leader. And um, some of my failings were not recognizing, uh, for example, the participation of women, the work that women were doing intellectually and politically, um, and also the everyday intellectual debates, which I argue newspapers um, in particular are really useful for getting at to see how this is more than just a few elite, educated, literate intellectuals that actually when we look at debates in newspapers, we see that and, and understand that newspapers were uh, being read out to entire families and in neighborhoods and communities that um, we can see, um, we can unearth the kind of workplace on the street in daily news intellectual debates. How active was uh, a woman's voice in newspapers when it comes to sort of um, activism? Um, again, these are predominantly, it depends. Now I, so I have to be very careful because uh, I, while there's, I'm working on comparative histories between West Africa and the Caribbean. And there are uh, similarities and interconnections, but these are also very different spaces. Um, in African owned newspapers in West Africa, it's, they are undoubtedly male dominated spaces. Um, there are, there is the first Nigerian woman's ed uh, editor in the 1930s. Uh, there are a few women journalists, there are women's columns. And actually um, I want, I've learned a lot from um, a colleague, um, who has worked on Cameroon and she really challenged me, um, Jacqueline Mugue, uh, who has done work to show how in women's columns in the British Cameroon, uh, yes, they are publishing recipes. Yes, they are talking about cooking and cleaning, but actually if you read them much more carefully, they are also talking about politics. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a number of, of works that I'm working through, that I'm thinking with right now, including um, Annette K. Joseph Gabriel's work, Reimagining Liberation, about French, uh, Black French women who, who fundamentally change ideas of citizenship, she argues. And so although these are male dominated spaces, you have a few female journalists. Um, and they are, and they they creatively speak about politics in ways that you could easily dismiss until you look more closely, um, as Jacqueline Magu has shown. And in in the Caribbean, um, what I've found is that women are particularly prominent in voicing um, in the 1930s labor revolts that are happening in in the Caribbean. It's women who are connecting these to the history of um, slavery, because one thing that's often forgotten is that the labor revolts happen at the centenary of emancipation. Like almost exactly in, in the case of Jamaica, the, um, the, the, the revolts of striking workers happens months before they're supposed to celebrate 100 years since the end of slavery. And it's women in, who are writing most specifically about um, understanding their present moment as as that as as a question of how far they have come in terms of freedom. So, what does freedom mean in 1938? Um, it means uh, it, it's it's fundamentally up for question, and it's women who bring that to the fore. Is that have we have we actually progressed far enough in terms of of freedom? That's really interesting um, uh, because I think when you look at um, when you look at decolonization or you look you look at anti-imperialism, um, I think it's very easy for you to gravitate towards Africa as opposed to to the Caribbean um, mm -hmm. because so many African independences happened roughly around the same time. Um, but that doesn't dismiss the, the, the impact of the work of people in the Caribbean and, and what they went through. And um, so give us sort of a, a, more of a snapshot of what, what 
those movements looked like in the Caribbean? So the Caribbean, um, we've already two things uh, that are essential to understanding the decolonization in the Caribbean have already come up. First, Garveyism. Mm -hmm. So the the way that Garveyism galvanized. Um, so you uh, scholars have worked on the U.S. Um, civil rights movement and and what you argued that what you can see is that a lot of people got their training for civil rights through the UNIA. And I think in some cases we can say the same thing that if we look at um, the movements that are happening in the Caribbean, a lot of people uh, were involved in the, in the Universal Negro Improvement Association, influenced, inspired by Garvey um, in the 1930s. And that gives them a kind of training ground to set up their own associations um, that are going to be fundamental. Um, and then the second thing is the labor revolt. So Caribbean decolonization um, happens, and, and, and when I say decolonization, I think uh, here I'm referring to political independence, sovereignty, self-government. Um, in the 1950s and early 1960s. And that, if you look at the political leaders, a lot of them were trade union, got their start in being trade union leaders, um, being involved in, either being involved in or, or on the outskirts of labor, of the labor revolts in the late 1930s. Um, and so one of the aspects of, of Caribbean decolonization is understanding that Caribbean political parties and associations share a very close connection with trade union parties and associations and workers associations, that that is a trajectory from workers associations into political parties. And that that then leads into um, the political organization of um, movements. But what's, un what's specific about the Caribbean as well is that um, it, uh, it, it moves along a path where the British colonial office say they're gonna create a West Indian federation. Mm -hmm. So it moves along a path of political federation as the form that independence is going to take. However, um, this, and, and this is the work of other scholars to say that what, what happened was that the colonial office worked at cross purposes because they moved to set up British West Indian Federation at the same time as they are um, slowly opening up voting processes in each specific colony, such that political parties begin to establish themselves in each specific colony. And um, political leaders are negotiating for more seats in the elected House of Representatives. And so they're, they're doing two things, um, one of which is to move to federation, the other of which is to set each colony in a different path towards um, political representation, which means that at the moment of independence and federation, um, it's very difficult for people to actually see how they're going to work in a federal model and federation famously fails. It only lasts a few years before uh, the two major uh, co um, colonies, um, former colonies, Trinidad and Jamaica leave the federation and then it falls apart after that quite quickly. Do you think that that was done by design so that, you know, th these, um, like, so that the, the the islands, the Caribbean islands, don't particularly have a strong force, um, a united force. Um, I haven't seen evidence that it is by design. Uh, and I think that the way that the colonial office and administration works, uh, that, that might be ascribing too much, uh, too much intention to what they do, I think, I think what happens is that they work at cross purposes because um, you know, governors on the spot and colonial administrators on the spot have a different aim and perspective often to the colonial office. And um, they're, 
I think it's a matter of not fully thinking through. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of, in some senses, responsiveness. So they say, oh, okay, well, we need to open up the elected number of elected house seats. Um, and so they start to slowly do that and not think about how it might be related to, um, to constitutional developments towards federation. Um, and so in some senses, they do things reactively and, and don't think about how that's going to imp influence policy. Going back to Padma for, for a moment, um, you mentioned that he, uh, his, his involvement in the Soviet Union led to him having this enormous network. Um, mm -hmm. What did he, do you think he capitalized on this network as, as well as he could have? Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, he, it, I've looked in the Soviet archives at the uh, people he's corresponding with in those early days. And those people um, prop up again and again afterwards. So he, for example, helps um, a Gold Coast um, editor, newspaper proprietor um, named Alfred John Okansi, who owns several newspapers, hires a man named Benjamin Muta Ofe to run a new newspaper called the Gold Coast Spectator. Padmore, when he's working for the Communist International, helps uh, them get a printing press. So okay. that that really sort of basic material, like how do we, we need to, we want to start a newspaper, we need a printing press, we can't afford a new expensive one. How do we get one? He helps that. And then you see that Padmore is writing in the Gold Coast Spectator for most of the 1930s and 1940s. And that connects him to um, any number of other organizations. So I think that he, took, uh, and, and the fact that he never changed his name back after he kept his nom de guerre um, shows that he was using the name that he made for himself as the publisher of the Negro Worker, as the man who was running the International Trade Union, Co Union Committee of Negro Workers. And that, that notoriety and network um, allowed him to move forward afterwards. Yeah, I, I think his, as I mentioned earlier, I think his story is a really, really compelling one. And I think, um, I think your book is definitely um, a much needed um, piece of literature on, on what this character, you know, entails whether throughout his journey. And, and so I definitely do recommend that people find it, get access to it. So on that note, where can people access um, you and where can people access the book? Uh, so you can access the book on um, any uh, in any in any online bookstore um, through Palgrave Macmillan, the publisher, um, Blackwell's in the UK. Blackwell's, um, I mean, it's on Amazon, but I I won't uh, promote Amazon too much. Um, and then me, I mean, you can email me at uh, leslie.james at qmul.ac.uk. And I would love to hear more of, of what people are doing. Because as I said, and, and I would emphasize this again, I, I see, I want to move away from the lone scholar who kind of is doing their work and publishing their things and recognize that I, my, all of my stuff comes from intellectual conversations and collaborations um, with people and, and through the thoughts and the words of the people that I'm working on um and and who are teaching me fundamentally so yeah anybody can contact me are you on twitter by any chance i am um what advice would you give to sort of a young um person um i would say a young woman getting into the field of um sort of looking at the cologne um decolonization and and um imperialism what advice would you give them um if they're if they were to explore character like how you did? Mm -hmm. um, follow your passion. Um, don't, don't, uh, don't let anybody tell you that, um, you know, especially that women were not involved um, and, and maybe take the time to figure out 
um, how you can look for the stories and look at material in a way that somebody that that goes against uh, the assumptions. Um, don't let anybody tell you that um, workers' demands aren't part of intellectual history. That um, that women's thoughts about domestic work aren't also part of intellectual history. Um, we can do lots of things to work out how those are intellectual histories. Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic bit of advice. Uh, Leslie, thank you so much for joining me. I've really enjoyed speaking to you and um, um, I hope to have you on sometime soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.